Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis and the endocytic pathway. Okay, so we've discussed how, uh, in order to pinch the clathrin-coated vesicle bud away from the plasma membrane, what we are going to do is assemble this dynamin-1 protein in this sort of spiral around the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. We're also going to make these rings of endothelin protein, which are going to wrap around that neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud as well. So I might just label this on as this is the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Okay, now what's going to happen next? Well, dynamin-1 is a GTPA, so this is equal to a GTPA. It is an enzyme. It has enzymic activity. It is capable of hydrolyzing GTP to GDP and inorganic phosphate. And its GTPase activity becomes more active when it oligomerizes. And it has oligomerized. Oligomerized, by the way, let me just write this down. Oligomerized just means that it has joined with other dynamin-1 proteins. Oligo means some basically. So it's a similar word to polymerized, okay? It maybe suggests that you've got slightly fewer of them joined together than if you used polymerized, okay? But basically, when you oligomerize or polymerize uh, dynamin-1, its GTPase activity becomes turned on, okay? So it's going to start hydrolyzing GTP, guanosine triphosphate, which is in the cytoplasm of the cell. So, here is guanosine triphosphate. What the, uh, what the uh, dynamin-1 is going to start doing is it's going to start hydrolyzing it to guanosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. So it's going to start cutting off the uh, gamma phosphate of the guanosine triphosphate. Okay, now GTP, guanosine triphosphate, is just like ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's just got a different organic base, uh, guanine rather than adenine. Okay, uh, but the point is, this reaction releases energy just like the hydrolysis of ATP. So the hydrolysis of guanosine triphosphate is going to release energy. So what's this energy actually going to be used to do? Well, basically, when the dynamin-1 starts hydrolyzing GTP and releasing this energy, what's going to happen is it's also going to change conformation. Basically, it's going to cause this spiral here of dynamin-1 proteins to tighten like a noose. It's going to tighten around the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle. So what's going to happen is something like this. Not a pretty sight. Okay, so here's our clathrin-coated um, vesicle, well, clathrin-coated vesicle bud at the moment. And what's happening is this dynamin-1 spiral is just tightening around the um, tightening around the neck of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud. Now, when it tightens, where is all the length of the dynamin-1 spiral going to go, basically? Well, instead, what has to happen is it has to wrap more times around the neck. So, basically, what I'm saying is there's a certain length of this dynamin-1 strand. If we tighten it up, if we reduce the diameter of this lumen uh, connecting the uh, extracellular fluid to the lumen of the, uh, oh sorry, to the um, center of the clathrin-coated vesicle bud, uh, then uh, what you're going to have to do is that length is going to have to go instead into wrapping it around more times because each wrap around is going to be less long now. Okay, so basically uh, you end up pulling the neck of the um, clathrin-coated vesicle bud longer and also constricting it. Okay, so what that means is now the clathrin polymerization can resume, it can continue on and almost form this buckyball, and what's going to continue to happen is eventually you're going to uh, pinch off this vesicle, basically. Okay, so this is then going to go to a membrane with a separate clathrin-coated vesicle down here. Okay, so we're still coated in this buckyball of clathrin triskelions. Okay, so here is our clathrin-coated vesicle now. So the endothelin and the dynamin-1 protein, more so the dynamin-1, are really important in this pinching off process, where we pinch the clathrin-coated vesicle bud off from the plasma membrane. 
Okay, and the result of this process is that we now have a clathrin-coated uh, endocytic vesicle. And I want to stress, this is an endocytic vesicle. It is not, repeat, it is not an endosome. People often use endosome when they mean endocytic vesicle. This is absolutely not an endosome. We will see what an endosome is when we look at the endocytic pathway. Okay, so it's not an endosome. Right, it's an endocytic vesicle. An endosome is something far, far bigger. Okay, the endocytic vesicle is going to the endosome. Right, so... Now, what's the first thing that happens once we have actually formed a clathrin-coated endocytic vesicle? Well, basically, you, this clathrin-coated endocytic vesicle cannot do anything. Repeat, it cannot do anything until it's taken that clathrin coat off. So, endophilin, this protein that we saw earlier in the um, pinching off process, is actually extremely important in the... Um, triggering of the removal of the clathrin coat. So let's now discuss this uh, role of endophilin in the removal of the clathrin coat. So basically, you still have some of these endophilin dimers associated with the clathrin coated um, uh, the endocytic vesicle here. And what they seem to be very important in doing is recruiting another enzyme here. Okay, so they bring another enzyme close to the clathrin-coated endocytic vesicle. So here are the endophilin proteins in orange here, or the endophilin dimer in orange there. Now, what is this new protein? And I feel like uh, Legolas asking Gandalf, what is this new demon? Okay, so uh, this protein coming up here and now associating with the clathrin-coated endocytic vesicle, this is... Um, a protein known as synaptogenin. Okay, so synaptogenin. Is it going to fit in? Janin. There we go. Synaptogenin. Now, synaptogenin is a phosphatase. It breaks phosphate groups off molecules. Now, unlike calcineurin, it is not a serine threonine phosphatase. A serine threonine phosphatase breaks phosphate groups off serine and threonine amino acids in proteins. Synaptogenin is going to target a certain molecule that is in the phospholipid bilayer of uh, the endocytic vesicle. And now, uh, we're going to discuss the structure of PIP2, PIP2, which we actually saw earlier. It was involved in this interaction between synaptotaglin 1 slash 2 and, um, and um, the um, adapter protein complex 2. Now, it's involved again in this process of removing uh, the clathrin coat. So... Let's see what synaptogenin does, and to do this, we need to look at the structure of uh, PIP2. So, before we can understand the structure of PIP2, we need to look at the structure of a normal old boring phospholipid. So, let me remind you of the structure of phospholipid. So, a normal phospholipid can be denoted like so. Okay, so these two lines here, these two vertical lines, which I've coloured in in orange, those represent the long-chain carboxylic acids, or the fatty acids, which are esterified to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. So these are fatty acids. Okay? Or, they're also known as long-chain carboxylic acids. So long-chain carboxylic acids. Okay, and you've esterified these long-chain carboxylic acids to the first and the second alcohol groups of glycerol. So let me now show you what glycerol is on this cartoon. So this horizontal line, which is now in green, this represents the glycerol molecule. So glycerol is also called propane-1,2,3 triol. Okay, so the chemist's name for glycerol is propane-1,2,3 one, two, three, and then trial. And although this is a more bigger mouthful than glycerol, uh, it 
is useful because it tells you exactly what glycerol actually is. It's a free carbon molecule with alcohol groups of the third, second, and third uh, carbon of that molecule. Okay, now you have these fatty acids, these long chain carboxylic acids bound by ester links to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule. To the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, instead what you have esterified to it within a phosphoester bond is a phosphate group. Okay, and this is linked to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule by a phosphate ester bond. Okay, so here is the phosphate group in red. Right, so the whole thing now is a phospholipid. So this is a phospholipid, and these are the usual stru this is the usual structure of the phospholipids that you have within the phospholipid bilayer of cells. Now there is another name for a phospholipid, an old name for a phospholipid, and this is to call the phospholipid a phosphatid date molecule. And although uh, you will very rarely hear anyone refer to a phospholipid as a phosphatid date molecule, when we're referring to modifications of phospholipid molecules, i.e. modified phospholipids, we use it all the time. And we'll see in the next video how uh, knowing that a phospholipid is also called phosphatidate is going to help us understand the naming of PIP2.